Not even the creators of a James Bond film could come up with a plot as intriguing and frightening as this. 32-year-old Princess Latifah is the daughter of Dubai's all-powerful ruler. She was born into a life of extreme wealth, but there was one thing her money couldn't buy, freedom. So four and a half months ago, with the help of a former French spy, she made a daring escape. But for all the meticulous planning, she failed spectacularly. And on the high seas, somewhere between Dubai and India, the runaway princess's yacht was intercepted. Latifa was kidnapped by heavily armed soldiers and hasn't been seen since. Hello, my name is Latifa Al Maktoum. I was born on December 5, 1985. Princess Latifa is the 32 year old daughter of one of the richest and most powerful men in the world, Dubai's ruler, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. And I'm making this video because it could be the last video I make. This 38-minute video, recorded days before her attempted escape from her homeland, contains allegations which, if true, blow apart the glossy billion-dollar reputation of Dubai as a progressive beacon in the Middle East. My vision is to Dubai to be number one. And the princess attacks her father's character as well. A man who mixes with royalty and rulers who's the world's largest investor in horse racing of the Dubai World Cup. and the force behind the globe's biggest airline, Emirates. All my father cares about is his reputation. And if you are watching this video, it's not such a good thing. Either I'm dead or I'm in a very, very, very bad situation. The princess has not been seen since March the 4th this year when it's claimed commandos stormed a yacht in international waters off India to grab Latifa and drag her back to Dubai. As intriguing as the claims are, the princess's story is backed by four main allies. The woman who escaped Dubai with Princess Latifa and was with her on the getaway yacht, Tina Jahainen. They were telling me, uh, close your eyes or we'll shoot you right here. Take your last breath now. What was the last image you have of Latifa? She was kicking and screaming and she was fighting for her life. And you haven't seen Latifa since then? No. The yacht skipper, French spy Hervé Joubert. I could not believe the daughter of the ruler would want to escape. You know, when a, a woman speak about abuse, torture, imprisonment. Australian human rights activist Rada Sterling, who received the final frantic telephone call for help from the princess. The first thing she said, help me, there's, there's people outside, there's men outside, I can hear gunshots, please help me. And I just jumped 20 feet in the air, you know, it was serious. And British lawyer and businessman David Haig. Have you made the whole thing up? Why, well, clearly not. And you know, the, the evidence is all there. You know, it's not just us now. The United Nations has accepted this. Human Rights Watch is behind us. It's not just us. At the beginning, it was just us. And we were battling everybody, thinking, well, this is so fantastic. It sounds like a movie. It can't be true. But then people started to realise it was true. Well, I swear I can see right through you. To the outside world, Princess Latifah lived a privileged and carefree life in Dubai. Her best friend, Tina Jahainen, says she had a passion for adventure, skydiving in particular. But there was also a darker side to her life. The princess confided in Tina how she'd been imprisoned and tortured after first trying to flee Dubai when she was a teenager. So in total, I was in prison for three years and four months. I went in in June 2002, and I came out October 2005. It was... Um, Constant torture, constant torture. Even when they weren't physically beating me up, they would torture me. Uh, they would switch off all the lights. I was in solitary confinement by myself totally. And there's no windows, there's no lights. So when they switch off the light, it was pitch black. They could switch it off for days. So I, don't, I didn't know when one day ended and the next began. 
She basically had no freedom. She had curfews. Obviously, she could not have a normal life and say, for example, date, date a guy if she wanted to. She was not allowed to have um, certain friends, even talk to certain family members. Um, her life was just very restricted and it felt like she always had to look over her so shoulder. She had also not traveled um, for nearly two decades. What kind of woman was Latifah? I mean, was she in a sense a Western woman trapped in the Middle East? Um, I always felt that Latifah was very different from other Emirati women. Uh, first of all, all her uh, friends were um, Westerners, so she didn't feel comfortable um, hanging around with the local people. Um, and she didn't feel like she belonged in that culture at all. Latifa felt trapped and oppressed here in Dubai. So eventually she hatched an extraordinary escape plan with her best friend Tina. It was equal parts Thelma and Louise and James Bond, at first fleeing by road to Oman, then by boat and jet ski to India, and finally flying to the United States where the princess was going to seek political asylum. The reward was freedom at last. But if both women were caught, well, the consequences would be dire. You must have been nervous helping her to organise her escape because if you got caught in the process of doing all of this, I mean, you were in big trouble. Yes, definitely. But she was willing to take the risk. She would often say, this, this is life or death for me. Um, she was so fed up with her life in UAE that she was willing to take the risk even if she would not make it. Escaping from Dubai was risky, but not impossible. So Latifa commissioned former French spy Hervé Joubert for the job. Years earlier, he'd masterminded his own escape from the city after his business dealings went sour and his passport was confiscated. So I understood that no matter what I said or no matter what I did, uh, I was being framed to, to be guilty, no matter what. As dramatised in this self-made documentary, Hervé masqueraded as a woman to smuggle himself out to a boat and sail to India. I was invisible. It, it doesn't matter if you're pretty or ugly or fat. Once you wear the abaya, you become invisible. I know I experienced it. I know exactly the, the, the feeling. Nobody is paying attention to you. Nobody is watching you. So the plan was to pick up Latifa and Tina right here uh, off Muscat and then sell uh, to Goa. Goa. Latifa's daring escape from Dubai was plotted over many months. Finally, at dawn on February the 24th this year, the moment of truth arrived. Before we got in the car, we're like, this is it, it's really happening. Um, we were hugging each other and so whatever happens, um, we're both doing this because we want to do it. And what was she like? Was she nervous or excited? Actually more excited than nervous because she felt like she has nothing to lose. Constantly on a tight leash, Latifa had to be smuggled out of Dubai in the boot of Tina's car. On the road to Oman, she stopped and completely changed her appearance. This is basically our last selfie in UAE. Um, as you can see, Latifa looks very excited. Um, it's her first time sitting in the front seat in the car. She's ever? All, yes, ever. She's all used to having a driver and sitting on the back seat as, yeah, as far as she's concerned all her life. Did she say it was a bit weird sitting in the front seat? She said it was weird but very liberating. We're like, we're like Telma and Louise. <laughs> and she actually said, no, 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 no. That doesn't have a happy ending. Don't talk about that. Once in Amman, they then faced potentially the most deadly leg of the escape. A five hour trip by dinghy and jet skis through high seas to international waters, where Hervé's yacht, the Nostromo, was waiting. But when I saw her, uh, I saw a woman who knew what she was doing. She was absolutely determined to get away. But there, is, there was no joy because the situation was tense. 
I, I would say it's like you, you are in a war zone. So you are not safe yet. So what happened then? You, you set sail for India? And then from right away, uh, turn around the boat and uh, uh, I sailed away. It was then an eight day voyage to Goa in India through what's infamously referred to as Pirate Alley off the coast of Oman. On day two of the journey, Latifa decided to message her family and let them know she'd escaped. Dear friends and family, I've left Dubai. And she was also stating the reasons. Did she get replies from any of her family members? Um, well, their responses were, were really um, shocking. Like one of her sister's reply was, what the fuck? The alarm was now well and truly raised. An Interpol red notice issued at Dubai's request confirms Latifa's disappearance, but it states she'd been kidnapped. Why did she message them at that stage and not wait until you'd made it to India? Um, I think she was so excited that she finally had her freedom. So she thought already she was free at this stage. She didn't think there was any, any trouble coming before they got to India. No, she was aware of some trouble coming, but imagine being um, living in a golden cage all your life. And trouble did come, just as they were desperately close to their destination. They'd almost reached India's tourist hotspot of Goa when Irve noticed they were being tracked by air and by sea. He claims the Indian Coast Guard was on their tail. But being in international waters, Hervé assumed they'd be safe. He was wrong. At 10 p.m. that night, they were raided. When they attacked us, it was brutal. I mean, brutal. And I'm a military guy. I, I, can't, I, can't know, uh, I know the difference between soft and, 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 and violent. And, and also, I was the captain. I was concerned for everybody else, my crew and, uh, and Latifa and Tina because had I made the wrong move, they would have shot me on the spot. I know, I saw their face, they, 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 those guys, they're they trained, you know, trained killer. That's when we started hearing noises from, from the upper deck, which sounded like gunshots. Uh, we were really, really scared. I thought that was it. I was, I was not going to make it. Coming up, they hit me. Blood was pouring out of my head. A desperate cry for help. Latifa telephoned me and said I can hear gunshots. And the princess is captured. She said, don't take me back to UAE, rather shoot me here. And now they've put themselves in the corner. The world is watching them. Where is she? That's next on 60 Minutes. Under the cover of darkness on March the 4th this year, Commandos storm the yacht captained by Frenchman Hervé Joubert, hunting for Dubai's Princess Latifa. Somebody grabbed me from behind. There was a guy in front of me with a gun to my face. And uh, somebody grabbed me by, uh, in the back. They handcuffed me. When I was handcuffed, they threw me on the floor and they hit me with, a, I, th I think, a rifle, uh, the, the barrel or something. Um, Where did they hit you? In the head. They hit me in the head. Blood was pouring out of my head. No help, no... Not, they did not even talk to me. They did not even ask me if I was the captain or who I was. Or... That's why I say it was a military attack. They knew what they were doing. Downstairs, locked in the toilet, is the runaway princess daughter of Dubai's all-powerful ruler, Sheikh Mohammed. Throughout her eight-day escape, Latifa had been in constant contact with Australian Rada Sterling, who runs the human rights group detained in Dubai. How did you first become aware of Latifa's case? Uh, Latifa contacted me um, a few days before the incident on the 4th of March. She contacted me via email and I disregarded it. I thought it was a hoax <laughs> and uh, you thought come on princess of Dubai what I, I actually thought it was someone in the UAE trying to set me up 
um, and, uh, for example, publish fake news and discredit me. Uh, so we went through a rigorous process of identifying and validating that it was, uh, you know, actually Princess Latifah. Latifah sent Rada copies of her UAE identity card and passport. And then there was this post on Latifah's verified Instagram account, announcing her escape and fear of the consequences. Fear that now appeared well-founded as the commandos were storming the boat. It was very concerning when um, Latifah telephoned me and said, I can hear gunshots. I can, you know, there's people outside. Um, help me, help me. And then completely disappears. The cabin started filling with smoke. Um, so we couldn't see it in front of us. We couldn't uh, breathe anymore. So we had to uh, start moving towards the upper deck. And on uh, top of the stairs, um, there was multiple uh, machine guns uh, pointing at us. The two women were handcuffed and thrown to the blood-stained decks of the boat. And the last Tina Jahainen saw of her best friend was Latifa being dragged off the boat at gunpoint. What was the look in her eyes at this stage? Uh, it was full of fear, but she was still fighting. She was not planning to give up. But she said, um, don't take me back to UAE, rather shoot me here. But regardless of her yelling and kicking, um, she was taken away. At that point, did, did they drag Latifa off the boat? So they, yeah, I, I, at that point they, they dragged her off the boat and uh, I never saw her again. With Latifa gone, Hervé and Tina claimed they were bundled onto a UAE warship, taken back to Dubai where they were thrown straight in prison. And then they put me in a cell in, a, in a solitary confinement. And did they tell you that you could be facing the death penalty? No, the next day I, I, I was uh, interrogated by, I believe, a high official. He said that I would be tortured before I get killed uh, with uh, graphic details. He said, for what you have done, you stabbed in the back the, the ruler. I said, I did not stab anybody in the back. I'm just helping a woman who wants to be free. No, it doesn't work that way. And he said that for what you did, uh, you are not going to be executed. You, uh, we're going to take your, we're going to pry your flesh bit by bit until you die. If claims of torture in Dubai sound too extreme to be true, then listen to David Haig's story. When you say torture, yeah. what are you talking about? Um, I was basically electrocuted um, and um, I was beaten severely. Um, uh, there was sexual abuse as well, um, which is very difficult to talk about still. Um, and I mean, it, so severe was what they did to me that when I was released, I spent six months in hospital recovering from the broken bones from, you know, and as well as the broken mind. David was the managing director of Leeds United Football Club, which was taken over by a Dubai business back in 2012. But when a dispute over finances erupted, he went to Dubai chasing debts, only to then find himself locked up on false charges that he would later be acquitted of. It all escalated so quickly, because one minute I'm coming there to have a meeting. The next minute I'm there as a bag check. And the next minute I'm standing in a police station in Dubai with police officers hitting me around the back of the head. David is now a human rights lawyer and has taken Latifa's case all the way to the United Nations. Some might say you're just out for revenge. Well, I think revenge is the wrong word. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, a girl called us. Ignore the fact that she's a princess, ignore the fact that she's from Dubai. That's irrelevant. If any lady or man or anyone had called me and said, you know, I'm on a boat, I can hear gunshots, can you help me? I think anyone watching this, would you say no? You wouldn't. Latifa's candid homemade video was the turning point in this whole drama. I didn't, I didn't feel the pain and it was like a half hour torture session. Human rights know. campaigner Rada Sterling released it to the media days after the boat was stormed. And the skipper, Hervé, is convinced that the spotlight it shone on Dubai saved his life. We were going to be executed. That I had absolutely no doubt in my mind. And if you think of it, it's logical. They want to eliminate witnesses and destroy evidence. They kill everybody. 
they will for sure try to discredit this video. It's my strong belief that uh, without the press coverage, without the spotlight on, on this case, that perhaps they would have been killed or certainly they would still be in the secret prison. I was driven to uh, the airport and they would walk me through uh, the passport control and all formalities and waited until I boarded the plane. That's when I got my passport back as well as my telephone. I, I'd imagine they were really mixed emotions getting on that plane. Yes, you were free. Yes, you were going to live, but you're, you're leaving your best friend behind. Exactly. Yes, I, I couldn't believe what was happening and what had happened. It all felt so unreal. Uh, I don't know what else to say. It's been four and a half months since the commandos stormed the boat and took Princess Latifa away. And still, there's been no formal response from Dubai, either confirming or denying the details of this extraordinary story. Our requests for an interview with a representative of the United Arab Emirates government have been declined. But unofficially, government sources in Dubai have been quoted as saying that the princess is back with her family and doing fine. But Latifa's friends won't rest until they hear the princess speak for herself. They're waging a very public campaign, demanding answers from the Sheikh and his government as to the whereabouts and safety of his daughter. If I don't make it out, I really hope that some positive change will happen from all of this. Imagine if the Queen of England had been accused of the same crimes, of human rights abuses, of um, imprisoning Prince Harry and torturing him. It would be worldwide outrage and scandalous. And there, there's no reason at all that the uh, ruler of Dubai should be treated any differently. It's got more and more and more embarrassing for him because they've tried to cover it up, they've lied about it, and they haven't been honest. And that's made what was already a very bad situation even worse. And the fact is now the world knows about what they've done in international waters, which they did in secrecy, expecting that nobody would. And their response to it has been terrible. The act itself was terrible. The response, also terrible. And now that they've put themselves in a corner. The world is watching them. Where is she? Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.